Welcome to Let's Do the Science, the show that comments on depictions of science and technology in the media news. Today we'll be exploring some topics from the latest episode of The Expanse. How are solar mirrors positioned over Ganymede? What's it like for children walking on low gravity? What are the physical effects of vacuum exposure? How do you hang from the rings of Tycho Station? Some thoughts on air mixture and the art of counterterrorism. So strap in and let's talk about the science of the expanse, season two, episode eight. When we pick up this week, Ganymede is suffering from the collapse of their light focusing mirrors from orbit. The mirrors are needed because they're using Ganymede to grow food for people out in the belt in Mars. Harder to grow here, but way easier to get into orbit seeing as the gravity is only about one sixth of the gravity on Earth. At this distance, sunlight is just too dim on Ganymede to grow food naturally. And there are many other issues that I'll cover in future episodes, but the mirrors are about getting enough light for the plants to grow at all. Here's a great shot demonstrating what I mean from a previous episode that goes by very quickly. But I love this shot because I really get the composition of it very right, and it would have been a little bit too difficult to pause and explain it to the audience, so just having it in the background at this level of accuracy was a lot of fun for me. It shows what the sun would look like way out here on Jupiter and from the surface of Ganymede itself. That bright spot right here is the sun, and it's only about 4% as strong as it would be back on Earth. Ganymede also spends about one of every seven days in total darkness as it orbits behind Jupiter, eclipsing the sun, so the mirrors would be vital to food production. Back to this shot of the mirrors. There seems to be a large array of them that likely bounce sunlight to a main mirror that directs it down to the surface. This way it can keep an almost constant focus of light on the domes. It was really interesting to think about how these mirrors had to be positioned and I initially made the assumption that it must be some kind of geostationary orbit. A geostationary orbit just means that a satellite orbits at a speed that keeps pace with the body it's orbiting, so it would appear to be over the exact same spot at all times. Now, I had assumed this, but looking at the image of the mirrors and doing some of the math, I realized that this just can't be the case. To achieve geostationary orbit around Ganymede means moving at a speed of one orbit per seven days. This is very slow in terms of orbital speeds. It has to be far enough away that the pull of gravity matches the outward centripetal force from the orbit so it stays stable and never degrades. There's a fairly easy equation for figuring out how far the orbit has to be at that speed. Doing a bit of the math, I come up with a distance of about 43,000 kilometers or 27,000 miles. Looking at the image of the mirrors and knowing that they're easily viewable in detail from the surface of Ganymede, there's just no way for them to be that far. So they must be kept in position through some kind of system of thrusters or engines. Considering the fuel efficiency we see on the show, that doesn't seem so far-fetched to me. Constantly maintaining mirror position would take a bit of work logistically, not the least of which is keeping the engines or thrusters fueled. Refueling really wouldn't be very hard though. Ganymede is about half water, more water in fact than all the oceans on Earth, and they could easily split water into hydrogen for fuel, as well as oxygen for other uses. It's also possible they have robotic ships that do constant runs out to Jupiter to scoop gases off the upper atmosphere. We don't know, but the point is there are several interesting and practical possibilities to accomplish this. A quick scene that caught my eye we see a little girl walking with a strange gait on Ganymede. Estimating her weight to be about 60 pounds, or 27 kilograms on Earth, that means on Ganymede she would weigh a little less than 9 pounds, or around 4 kilograms. I looked up some studies from the National Institutes of Health that indicate walking in low gravity would obviously take less work, but the maximum speed would go down to retain balance in much lower gravities due to a pendulum effect that happens between the pel pelvis, your relative weight, and center of gravity. Now the scene is too short to know, but we'll be able to explore this in future episodes to see how they express it in the show. But her slow walk and her bounce that she's trying to approximate, that would be about what I would expect in this low level of gravity. It might even be that people who live here normally compensate by wearing weight belts or weights in their clothing of some kind 
or provide extra mass to themselves so they can stay balanced in one way or another. Before I start the next segment, I want to warn everyone that it's going to be covering a very difficult and heart-wrenching scene depicting some people dying in space. So if this material is too difficult, feel free to jump ahead and I'll be sure to put some links in the show notes to jump to the next segment. The scene in question shows people in an airlock when the doors open to space. There isn't the typical hurricane force winds you see in most shows when the doors open, with everyone being sucked out into space immediately. Instead, the depiction is much more accurate, with an initial burst of air and very little movement. The volume of air in that room would move out very quickly into space and not impart much motion onto the people at all inside. When they do eventually move out of the airlock, it's because the ship fires its maneuvering thrusters to move the ship, leaving people in the same relative position. As I said, a very difficult scene to watch, but a real testament to the powerful human stories they tell on the show. The cold and methodical kind of evil on display here is an all too real example of the kind of inhumane acts that refugee populations can sometimes face. The scene goes so far as to show people still conscious and moving a bit in space, and it led me to look up some of the literature on the actual effects of vacuum. This is a big question I had from a sequence that happened all the way back in season one, where a belter exhales and opens his visor briefly to take out a floating wire, then closes it and goes about their work. I initially had some serious doubts about that, but doing some reading, I realized the show got both of these scenes very right. Most of what we know about vacuum exposure comes from animal tests from the 50s and 60s, as well as a small number of accidents during the space race of that era. In a particularly fascinating incident that had a happy ending, a NASA technician named James LeBlanc was testing the integrity of spacesuits in a vacuum chamber when one of the hoses detached. He said he obviously felt something wrong, though it wasn't particularly painful, and he could feel the liquid boil away on his tongue due to the low pressure. He passed out, and safety crew were able to pressurize the chamber in only about 30 seconds. A doctor arrived shortly, and LeBlanc woke up and stood back up, apparently fine if a bit disoriented. LeBlanc lived into his 80s with no apparent ill effects from the event. So depictions on the show of exposure to vacuum not being immediately fatal seem accurate from the evidence. Likely those exposed would stay conscious for a short while. Decompression of their lungs and inner ear would be most immediately painful, but LeBlanc's experience indicate it wouldn't be debilitating. Decompression sickness would set in and include nausea, disorientation, joint pain, and other symptoms, but it's unclear if they would stay conscious long enough to significantly experience those effects. A hard scene, as I said, and taking the time to get the science right really brought it home emotionally for me. Later in the show, we see the character Amos walking on the outer edge of the Tycho station ring. The ring spins in the opposite direction of the rest of the station for reasons I'll get into in a future show, and the spin pushes people inside against the outer edge to simulate gravity. Amos has to exit the bottom of the station, which for him would be like hanging from a ceiling over a bottomless pit. This made for an unexpectedly exciting action scene as he tries to hold himself on long enough to get his magnetic boots attached to the hull. Even then, the movement is difficult because the station is swinging him around by his feet, and for him, it's like he's hanging upside down while trying to work. I don't know how the crew did this next effects, but you can see him welding here with the sparks flying away from the station like they would if they were dropping from the ceiling, so even the motion of the sparks are right. And it's all together, this little package made for a very enjoyable scene, just because of how much it made you think, just because they got it so accurate. At one point in the show, some terrorists have taken over the command and control center, and the protagonists decide to use a tactic that would likely be very common in space, messing with the air mixture in the room. Given what we talked about before, you might expect them to just evacuate the air and wait for everyone to pass out, but that presents a few problems. Guns are likely to have been modified to use solid ammo or sealed casings that enable them to fire in a vacuum and people inside the room would immediately know something was going on. 
Although we noted people can survive vacuum exposure, it's still a huge risk as someone could have an embolism or suffer a heart attack, so this wouldn't be a particularly good tactic for hostage rescue. Instead, you can hear the characters talk about messing with the carbon dioxide scrubbers, increasing the amount of nitrogen in the air supply, and cutting off the oxygen. This would have several effects that might work. Increasing nitrogen will replace the missing 21% of oxygen in the air, so people inside wouldn't notice a pressure difference and likely remain unaware that anything was wrong until the effects started to set in. Increased carbon dioxide and lack of oxygen would quickly lead to sluggishness and disorientation, and eventually to unconsciousness. Likely not as fast as the scene gives, but again, it's a TV show so they need to get right into the action. This short bonus commentary here, we get a scene near the end of the Rosinante leaving Tycho Station. If you watched last week's show, you recall I talked a bit about ships falling away from the ring when they detach due to the rotation, and we can see that happening here. So kudos to the showrunners for giving it to us this week. That's it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed it, it would help me a lot if you please click the like button below. As always, I'd love to hear your comments on what you heard today and what you enjoyed. If we left something out, missed anything, or you have something to add. If you've gotten this far, leave a comment with the hashtag Let's Do The Sigh and I'll know you've listened to the whole thing. If you want to catch future episodes, be sure to click the subscribe button below and for notifications, click the bell icon next to subscribe to get a pop-up when we post a new show each week. You can also follow me on Twitter at Streamweaver or use the hashtag Let's Do The Sigh. Thanks for joining me and as always, stay curious.